Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar this evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about combating plant blindness and the tools that you can use in order to do so. We'll also be talking about the curriculum from Ponderosa to Prickly Pear and how you can implement that into your existing programming. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about um, Jeff and myself, the two educators that will be leading the webinar this evening. So my name is Sarah Digby and I work for the Institute for Applied Ecology as a co-educator for the Native Plant Curriculum, as well as contracted with the Native Plant Society as their outreach coordinator. So I do a lot of work with get, spreading the word about native plants. My email is listed below as well as my phone number and you can find a little bit more information about me at the link below the phone number as well as about the Native Plant Society. Our second presenter this evening is Jeff DePew and he also works for the Institute for Applied Ecology as our education coordinator. You can also find out a little bit more information about him at the link below. The uh, Institute for Applied Ecology is uh, its mission incorporates uh, restoration, uh, restoration ecology, research, and education. Uh, some of the Southwest program examples are uh, on the ground restoration and, and resources with the uh, Southwest Seed Partnership, um, and also the Lenora Curtin Wetland. Uh, dealing with uh, invasive species control. The Southwest Seed Partnership is improving uh, our supplies of native seed uh, in New Mexico and in the Southwest with Arizona as well. The education uh, part of our Southwest program incorporates the Native Plant Society outreach that Sarah told you about, uh, uh, Project Botany, uh, which is dealing with our native plant curriculum uh, from Ponderosa to Prickly Pear, uh, and then the Forest Bound program, which is a high school summer program that we operate in the summertime, utilizing this curriculum and uh, a lot of time outside. We're outside every single day for four to five days. Uh, and then research, we're involved with the New Mexico Milkweed Establishment Studies. Uh, which is uh, in two major parts across the state uh, where we have uh, planted uh, uh, several thousand milkweed species and are monitoring those. And so the Institute is actually the main office is based in Oregon. And so they've been doing a lot of this work for um, a long time over um, on the west coast in Oregon and so recently within the last few years um, this work has been brought over to the southwest and so we're implementing a lot of those things that have been successful uh, over in Oregon now to New Mexico and kind of replicating a lot of those programs. Uh, so uh, kind of the uh, game plan for tonight is we're going to talk about uh, the concept of plant blindness and it's kind of its history and what it means. And then uh, we're going to get into uh, the native plant curriculum here that we use, uh, that we developed uh, from Ponderosa to Prickly Pear, uh, go through several of the uh, lesson plans, uh, you know, where they uh, correspond with, uh, with uh, New Mexico um, science standards and uh, how to use them, uh, some of the ways that we've used them. We're going to break for questions after that, uh, and then we'll do uh, some lesson plans, looking at uh, specifically uh, sample lessons and talking about those. Uh, then we'll break for questions, uh, and then we'll talk about taking it further, where we're planning on going with this curriculum, uh, educator resources, uh, working with educator resources, uh, they want to partner with uh, the Institute for Applied Ecology, um, what we're hoping to do in the future with the curriculum, uh, our summer program, Forest Bound, and tell you a little bit more about that program as well. And then we'll stop and have questions uh, afterwards. So we've had this common thread um, uh, throughout the publicity for this webinar um, of plant blindness. And so what is it really? So to quote it, it is the inability to see or notice the plants in one's own environment 
leading to the inability to recognize the importance of plants in the biosphere and in human affairs. So what does that mean in real life? How, how can we tangibly observe that, um, particularly with the youth here um, now? One way that we see it is, say you show um, you know, a child this picture and ask them, what is this a picture of? Chances are they're going to say it's a picture of monkeys. They may not have any familiarity with the plants that are in the surrounding area, you know, specifically what they are, um, what their names are, but they definitely would know that this is a monkey. So this idea of plant blindness is really um, not being aware of the plants that are around us and therefore not establishing a relationship to those plants and uh, recognizing the importance of those plants within the environment. And so there's a good link um, you can see to the side of this picture that's a whole article on plant blindness and how it's a quite a big epidemic with the youth um, today within uh, the United States specifically. And I want to point out that, you know, plant blindness is kind of a almost a, a westernized idea in that many cultures uh, don't experience plant blindness throughout history. So many indigenous cultures have uh, highly regarded plants um, for their medicinal value, for their intrinsic value, uh, for their food value, and recognize how important they are within the greater ecosystem as a whole. So we're talking about something that's kind of um, within the culture of what we live in today and um, with what our youth are experiencing here. And so how do we combat it? What do we do? You know, why do we care about this? So, you know, we we care about plants because of their intrinsic value, right? Um, you know, they we know that they're important within the ecology overall, but not everybody um, has that same relationship with them. So how do we kind of establish that relationship? So there's a picture of me. Here's a picture of Jeff. Um, so we don't really know anything about native plants specifically, but we do have our likes of um, other things that may relate to native plants. We love food. We may love beauty. We may love animals. We may love alternative medicine. And we may just love the earth as a whole. All of these things are deeply linked to native plants, and they all need native plants to be able to, um, you know, be subsistence. So food, our plants need pollinators. Our pollinators rely a lot on native plants. Same thing with plants as beauty. They rely on pollinators to grow. So native plants are a really important aspect to many, um, many parts of the world that we live in. So let's take a look at another example more specifically. So we've got the monarch butterfly. <laughs> I have talked with many young students um, throughout different schools here in New Mexico, and most people know about the monarch butterfly. It's a really important, um, valued butterfly within New Mexico specifically, as well as nationally. People are putting out monarch um, watches. Uh, people are trying to bring awareness of the fact that we need um, to research the population of monarchs because some of the monarchs are disappearing. So when I ask them, you know, what do you, what is this animal? They can easily tell me it's a monarch. Then when I ask them, what is this plant? They can easily tell me it's milkweed. And I was actually surprised that even a lot of the kindergartners that I talked to knew what this plant was. Why did they know what this plant was? Well, it's because of the fact that they had a connection to another thing, they had a connection to that monarch butterfly. So they've established a connection to this native plant as it associates to another animal. And so oftentimes when we talk about, you know, saving the earth, we kind of talk about animals specifically, or we talk about earth as a whole. We don't necessarily talk about plants. And so the way that we can get people to get interested in native plants is to create a relationship. So all of these things have in common. All these things have in common is the fact that they have a relationship to us as humans. Food, beauty, animals. We can relate to these things even if we can't relate to native plants. We can understand that they play a role in that. So again, how do we combat it? You find a connection between humans and plants. 
you can establish a relationship and then you build upon that relationship through exciting and engaging experiences. And how do you do that? You can address that need through applicable, accessible programming. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is a really interesting uh, photograph that illustrates some of that. Uh, this is, a, is a, a plant that's called an arum. Uh, this particular one is a tropical arum and uh, it, its species. And uh, people didn't know about this plant at all. It just bloom in the greenhouse on uh, a specific date, a specific time for a day. And uh, eventually people uh, would pass by the greenhouses. They'd look in the window, they'd see this thing blooming, and uh, the botanical garden opened it up so that people could come in and get a closer look. And now it's one of the most popular uh, exhibits at uh, various botanical gardens, the Missouri Botanical Garden being one of them where people come in and take a look at this plant. The plant has been written up in newspapers and, you know, telling people, you know, this plant only blooms one specific time. You have to come see it right now. And uh, it's creating this really wonderful relationship, intimate relationship with an unusual plant, uh, but nevertheless a plant. And it uh, becomes a really wonderful uh, exhibit for botanical gardens and a really wonderful educational opportunity. So we did a, um, a survey uh, of uh, many of you that signed up for this webinar uh, in the form of a questionnaire. And we found out some really interesting statistics of uh, who teaches what, where you guys are from, whether you're a community educator uh, or a parent or a regio teacher or uh, someone from a cultural institution uh, or public lands, as well as science teachers in the classroom. And we found out uh, some of the topics that um, you didn't feel comfortable teaching or the populace didn't feel comfortable teaching were plant collections, dichotomous keys, botanical gardens, plant migration, phenology, uh, citizen science, and not really understanding what citizen science is, measuring and monitoring. Uh, you can see it uh, kind of laid out in front of you right there. Um, the other thing that we found out that uh, the existing programs that you guys had, what you needed more improvement in was uh, native plant information, local plant information, more time out of the four walls outside. So uh, we went a little further into it and found out that, uh, uh, that some of you have room to implement existing programs like uh, Ponderosa to Prickly Pear. Uh, some of you can get outside, whether it's for a walk or whether it's a field trip, um, and that a chunk of you really don't know exactly what citizen science is, but you want to be more involved with it, and you want to know more about plants, local plants, invasive species, uh, and in general, a lot of general basic ecology. So what is the Institute's solution for plant blindness? Our solution was to develop a um, curriculum that addresses many of these issues that we um, you know, face today by creating an experiential education opportunity for our youth um, to engage with native plants in a really fun way. We have some guiding principles that we used when uh, developing this curriculum. So those guiding principles are that it's place-based. So it's actually specific to the communities that we're working in. So when we made um, the first curriculum was actually developed in Oregon. And from that, we were able to take um, a lot of that information and that framework and build a curriculum specific to New Mexico. And it also follows many of the different eco-regions. So it's not only of New Mexico, but it can follow specifically different areas and um, specific areas within New Mexico. It's hands-on, so students are able to engage all of their senses when working with this curriculum. We, uh, the folks who established this curriculum worked really hard on trying to engage all of the senses, not just specifically how can we work science in, but how can we also 
work with students' creativity, you know, incorporating drawing opportunities, incorporating ways that they can really, um, you know, delve into this in a way that's going to engage much more than just writing on a piece of paper. It's inquiry-based, so students are learning the science through asking questions about the natural areas that are surrounding them. It's experiential, so they are actually experiencing, uh, you know, the forest around them. The goal is to get students outside. They're doing rather than just reading about it. It's service learning, so students are able to take these um, skills that they're acquiring and better their community with it. They're understanding the intrinsic value of their work through this curriculum that they're learning from, and they're able to take these skills and apply them to a career in the future. The curriculum is great because it follows the core education standards for New Mexico. It also is really great for establishing community partnerships. We were able to work with a number of different people when we worked in the Forest Bound program, and we'll talk about that a little bit f further later. But community partnerships are an excellent opportunity to really delve into this curriculum and get some help with exploring all of these lesson plans. It's interdisciplinary, and it follows, um, it was developed with the NAEE guidelines as well. So if you want to take a look at either of those, both of those are links once you get that PDF. So we have a couple options for you to be able to acquire the curriculum. Uh, we do have a number of free copies still available. So we were able to get some funding to print a number of free copies for teachers within New Mexico. And we've gotten a fair amount of them out, but we want to be able to have this be accessible as possible. So, um, you know, we really want to give teachers the opportunity to get a copy of it. So if you are interested in the curriculum, you are welcome to contact us and we can try and get a free copy out to you. Like I said, there are a limited amount of free copies um, from a hard copy. So after we run out of their free copies, then the, they will be available for purchase um, at $31 per uh, book. You can also download the curriculum for free. Both of these are links. So they'll take you directly to the pages where you can either purchase a hard copy or download it for free. So uh, getting into the, the Common Core State Standards with this curriculum was a lot of fun because we kept on finding places that our lesson plans met state standards. So we not only uh, cover quite a bit in the uh, benchmark one of strand two, standard two in the life sciences, uh, ecosystems, energy flow in the environment, biodiversity. Um, we also uh, we also cover uh, a good chunk of uh, strand one, standard one, benchmark one in uh, scientific thinking and practice, where. Uh, uh, really is the process of uh, uh, scientific investigations using inquiry and scientific ways, observing, experimenting, thinking critically. We're just doing it outside. So we even cover some of benchmark two um, as well as benchmark three that has to do with math and has to do with uh, scientific knowledge that's validated and, uh, and evaluated, uh, especially with our uh, measuring and monitoring uh, lesson plans was number 22 and as well as uh, the uh, phenology and uh, plant migration uh, lessons 26 and 27. So uh, it, it is interesting that we can go through these standards and continually find where our lesson plans uh, meet some of these uh, requirements. Uh, even in biological evolution, uh, plant wars and native plants uh, uh, deals with uh, number eight and nine of biological evolution. So um, these cover a lot of the state standards and uh, just make it even that much better for the classroom teacher to be able to utilize the curriculum uh, and in a way that gets students uh, outside and more involved with hands-on work. And there were over 30 advisors that actually came together to create this curriculum. So there was a number of teachers, students, um, science curriculum developers, all the way to natural resource agencies, artists, and field science 
scientists alike. So there was a lot of folks that came together to make this curriculum happen and really provide an option to make it extremely interdisciplinary for the students and for teachers. So we're gonna kind of go over um, how the curriculum works. It's laid out really nicely so that it's easy for teachers to be able to um, pull out a lesson plan if they wanna use them individually or kind of go along um, as an entire program. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still getting over a cold. Um, so, you know, the main goal of this curriculum is getting outside into nature. So while there are many of these lesson plans that you can utilize both in the classroom and outside, the real goal of the curriculum is to try to get outside as much as possible. That said, we understand that not everybody can get outside. And so it's great that these lesson plans are so versatile that you don't necessarily have to be outside in nature to apply them within the classroom. So um, when you're taking a look at the curriculum, once you have it in hand, you'll see that there's a table of contents, which is um, very well laid out. It's structured by seven major sections, and each section has references which are numbered accordingly. So when you are looking through these lesson plans, each one is going to give you um, a lot of different references. It's going to give you more information that you can look up. It's going to give you, um, you know, a, a, just a whole range of information so that you can be as well prepared as you can be for these lessons. The book gets progressively more advanced. And at, towards the end, it ends with opportunities that students can have for projects, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So you can take a look at these sections, see how they're laid out. Section one is plant identification. So it goes through how to identify a plant, how to key it out. It goes through um, you know, how we talk about botanical names and botanical terms. It talks about families, how to make your own plant a collection. Basically the fundamentals of what's gonna set you up for success for the remainder of the curriculum. Section two covers the ecoregions of New Mexico. So we're getting more into the areas that we live versus other areas within New Mexico versus other areas of the world and establishing our relationship to the place that we call home. Section three is the ecology of native plants. So we're extending past the native plants, specifically looking at soil structure, looking at pollinators, um, looking at how plants interact with their local environment. Section four, talking about non-native and invasive plants. There's a lot of great lessons in here that engage all of the senses. There's an opportunity for students to draw. There's an opportunity for students to really explore what it means to be an invasive plant. And in that, it talks about field journaling, which is a really important aspect to this whole curriculum. Section five is a really fun one, so it's the ethnobotanical look at native plants. So we kind of look at who walked here before me. Um, there's some information on um, making a couple different things with native plants. And this is where a great opportunity is to partner with other organizations. Um, if you don't necessarily feel comfortable or have uh, the knowledge to talk about ethnobotanical uses for plants, uh, there's a lot of other people that would be willing to share that knowledge in a great way. Section six is climate change and phenology. And section seven is the future of native plants. And so this is where we get more into the actual applicable um, lessons for using these native plants. So you see there's designing a habitat restoration plan. We also wanna to touch on, um, in the back of the book, there are a number of great resources for you. So there's a glossary, there's a numerous pages of all of the, the different vocabulary that students can look up, and also for, student, for uh, teachers as well. So there's the vocabulary word as well as the definition, and then there's a, a number of appendices. So we have uh, a couple of examples here. We have the recommended field guides for New Mexico, 
we have schoolyard species lists for New Mexico ecoregions, and this one's really great, and it's an extensive list of a number of different native plant species that you can use in um, the school gardens. There's also a list of invasive plant species, as well as a New Mexico ethno ethnobotany plant list, food plants, medicine plants, and fiber plants. So there's a lot of ways that you can uh, get the most out of the curriculum. Uh, one of those ways is to immediately when you're implementing this curriculum within your existing program or if you're starting a new program, it's great to start a student field journal at the beginning of the study, finding field guides specifically for your area, and then planning ahead looking at where you can actually take your students if you are able to take them outside to find local areas that are going to really help um, make this program extremely robust. And then, of course, as we said, making community connections. So field journaling is uh, an exceptional way to use this curriculum, as well as to uh, take students outside, as well as working inside with students. Uh, I've given my students journals that uh, it probably cost too much for me to pay for, but I, I pay for them anyway. And, and they were wonderful because they were blank page journals that really encouraged uh, them to do drawings, uh, to do field drawings, to do drawings of plants themselves, uh, as well as to uh, mark off different parts of the, of the journal to be able to, uh, to put plant names and sometimes even some uh, botanical pressed uh, plants uh, that they put in their journal as well. So that by the time they're done with their field journal, if you know for the year, uh, it's a really rich uh, uh, apportioning of, of wonderful work that the student has done and they can go back and assess it and look at it and feel very proud about it. But it's also a great way to keep uh, a lot of the information that comes out of this curriculum in one spot uh, with each uh, with each lesson plan that you go through. Um, so I can't say enough about field journaling and this uh, lesson plan uh, that begins on page 138 in the curriculum uh, goes through really specifically how to um, and gives you, uh, you know, self-assessment ideas as well as gives you the materials that are needed, teacher hints, and goes through a lot of what the student can do uh, in keeping this beginning field journal. So we also wanted to um, briefly go over kind of what a lesson plan looks like. So these lessons are great because they're consistently formatted. So at the beginning of each lesson, you're going to see this overview. So as we said, the curriculum can be used as a complete unit of study. So you can go from um, front to back in, in order, or if you want to uh, break up the lessons and reorder them, you can, but it's great to use as an entire program. However, if you can't do that, the lessons are able to be used on their own individually. So they do build off of each other, but you don't have to use them all together. So when you're taking a look at this lesson plan, there's a lot of information in here for you to know how the lesson is going to go. You can see there's a time estimate, so it'll say how long they, um, when this lesson was developed, how long they think it's going to last within the classroom. The best season for this lesson specifically, so you've got fall, spring, summer, typically there aren't going to have any winter ones. There are also teacher hints, so there's some more information on how to effectively implement this lesson. There's any vocabulary that you might be running into in the lesson that you want to go over beforehand. There's the overview of the entire lesson, how to prepare, and the learning objectives. So this gives you some framework to work from of how this lesson is going to go and um, some different ways that you can implement it. For the students, uh, there are a lot of lesson plans in here that are really self-directed uh, for them that they can do. Uh, teachers uh, or parents uh, can kind of assign to them 
as uh, homework or as a project uh, that they can do uh, over the course of uh, you know a, a week or so. Um, so the, you know, all the lessons can be done in groups or individually, um, and you can also integrate them into uh, service learning, uh, community projects, and as I said, uh, project-based or independent project-based learning for themselves. Um, and it uh, becomes a really powerful tool uh, that, that crosses over for independent study with students. And so as we kind of talked about, a lot of these lessons can be used in the classroom or in the field. And so there are going to be um, little hints of how you can apply these different lessons in the field within each individual lesson. It's also great because it um, talks about, you know, if there are folks that are finishing early, it gives them an opportunity for um, exploring the lesson plan a little bit further. Um, so it gives some information on that as well. As well as uh, when they finish, as Sarah was pointing out, and there's self-assessment there as well. So it becomes a really uh, a complete independent study project for uh, that gives you, you know, to be able to move on after you've finished, as well as to be able to assess uh, what you've done and uh, helps the teacher out in that respect as well. We are going to open it up really quick. Um, if there are any questions that folks have, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now and open it up for some questions of the first section. Uh, this is Robin, and I have a question. Um, Hi, if you were going to do the whole Hi, if you were going to do the whole course with your students, is it a year long course? Yeah, I would say uh, that I've used quite a bit of, I'm a classroom, past classroom teacher as well as environmental educator. Um, and I could definitely use this all year long uh, because so many of the lesson plans are adaptable uh, to different seasons. Um, as well as uh, you know, diff well, different seasons and different times of the school year, they, it does. As Sarah said, they do build uh, in uh, you know the, the kind of the complexion of the way that the student has has grown and developed to the point where at the end of the curriculum, it's a, you're designing a, a restoration plan. So I would say this is the type of curriculum that would be used all year long and interspersed in your own uh, curriculum lesson plans, your own plan, uh, as to where they can support uh, what you are planning do, to do. On the, on the flip side, uh, you could make a, a year out of this curriculum. You could use this as basically your textbook. Uh, and looking through yeah. the science standards, uh, you're covering just an enormous number of science standards. Uh, with this curriculum. Great. I have one more question. Um, do you, I, I saw that you have the, um, I think it's called Forest Bound Program. And is that just for students or is that also for um, like a professional development experiential learning for teachers? So currently the Forest Bound program is specifically designed for high school students. So it's kind of a, a week long opportunity for them to get out in the forest and learn more extensively about native plants. Uh, I think that's an interesting idea. We haven't really explored it, but we'll talk a little bit more about the Forest Bound program um, in a little while and give more information on it. But as it stands right now, it is specifically designed for high school students. That's a great suggestion though, Robin. That's, that's okay. The, the type of thing that we want to think about as this program moves forward. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and we'll give you all the information yeah. of where you can find um, find information on the program in a little bit. Okay, I'd be really interested. I've been looking for 
this kind of program to do to actually go out in the in nature and do so I can learn it a little bit better. Yeah, and we do actually have opportunities for people to volunteer within our summer programs as we stand now. So if that is something that you're interested in um, being a part of, you can come and kind of uh, audit what we're doing yeah. and see uh, how we're implementing the curriculum. Uh, right now, we're teaching in the Santa Fe National Forest. We have a proposal okay. for the Cibola Forest. Um, so we'll see kind of where the funding lies for that. But definitely get in touch with us and we can talk about, um, you know, if, if you have the time and availability to audit, you are more than welcome to do that as a way to kind of gain a little bit more familiarity with the curriculum and native plants overall. Yeah, it's a great idea. And so this is... Okay. So this is specifically the Institute for Applied Ecology. So the Native Plant Society does partner in providing some hours for this, and the information will be located on the Native Plant Society website. Um, and so right now, there's not a whole lot of information. Registration starts in 2018, so we're going to build up that information as it comes. So it's kind of a stay tuned opportunity, but we will give you the direct link of where you can find more information on the program. Great. Okay, unless there's any more questions, we're going to keep rolling ahead. Okay. So some examples of lesson plans uh, that we want to go through is um, uh, there is a uh, a uh, lesson plan of uh, plants have families too. It's an in-class opportunity um, to understand how plants relate to one another, their coevolution, uh, as well as uh, connection between different species or uh, evolution of species. Uh, there's also a measuring and monitoring lesson um, that um, is uh, designed to get students outside. Uh, designed to utilize uh, some of the equipment of uh, the conservation trade, um, like uh, quadrat frames, uh, some measuring tapes. Uh, we have uh, compasses and we have uh, field guides to uh, be able to go through a quadrat plot and figure out what uh, the plants that are there, identify them, and figure out uh, density, uh, of those species and dominance of those species um, and look really carefully at uh, different sections of a uh, habitat. Um, so as I kind of alluded to, the skills that uh, are acquired with this lesson uh, really transfer really easily to career opportunities within uh, fish, and, fish and wildlife, the Forest Service, uh, wetland uh, scientists, a uh, number of different types of conservation agencies, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, to do these types of studies, which yield a lot of information about one place or one habitat. We also have a really wonderful um, lesson plan that deals with ecoregions. And it, it's one of my favorites because it uh, dovetails into another lesson plan uh, called A Place I Call Home, uh, which is obviously very place-based. Uh, understanding our relationship uh, in our ecoregion, what is an ecoregion, uh, understanding uh, habitats, understanding plant zones, understanding elevation in plant zones, uh, understanding where these different areas are across uh, New Mexico, and really getting a, a much better understanding of the state in which they live, we live, uh, how unique it is uh, determined by all these different factors, climatological factors, soil factors, uh, density and dominance, plants factors, plant zones, elevation. Uh, it's really wonderful nine pages of that lesson plan which I said dovetails into another seven pages right after it, which is called uh, Place I Call Home. Really three uh, wonderful lesson plans designed to have students understand plants, native plants, uh, where they live, uh, and some really, really cool 
uh, monitoring skills uh, that are easily transferable to uh, to careers, different careers. So we'll take a little bit more of a deeper look at these lessons individually. So we'll start with plants and families too. And this is a great lesson um, to use both in the classroom as well as outside. So you don't have to have access to, um, you know, outdoors to be able to talk about plant families. It does help to be able to have something tangible in the student's hand, you know, you can also bring in a number of plant specimens into the classroom and have kids look at, um, you know, the characteristics of the plants or the, uh, the leaves or the flowers uh, to be able to see how these plants relate to one another and how, uh, what kind of families they reside in. So this one is great to use after the botanical terms challenge specifically because they can use the vocabulary and the different terminology that they've learned from that lesson plan um, to look at the plant families and talk about it with other students in groups. And so when we start to explain how these plants relate, the students are going to have the vocabulary to do so. So when you're looking at this lesson plan, it's great to do at any time during the year. Um, so you're going to either go outside or you're going to bring in several specimens of families, uh, of plants from different families for the students to look at. Um, and then there is also a supplementary uh, different family chart with all the main families that are located within New Mexico. It has a general um, overview of what that plant family is. Then it talks about the leaf characteristics, flower characteristics, fruit, if there is any associated with it. It gives a number of examples of natives of New Mexico within that family. Any common weeds that could be uh, associated with that plant potentially or within that family. And then also uh, how they can potentially be used as garden or landscape plants. And so this is a great supplemental list to incorporate when students are learning about these plant families. It, it gives a lot of information um, so that the teacher doesn't have to go out and do all of the research themselves. And so this is a great kind of um, fundamental lesson to do with students to get them familiar with plants after you've talked about uh, the different terminology of how to identify certain plants, you can begin to talk about how the plants relate to one another and what families they actually belong to. When you're out in the field, this is also a really great um, skill to have because we're not always going to know the specific name of a plant, Latin or common, but we all can um, use this information from the plant families to at least see what family it belongs to and to make an educated guess. And so this is an example of uh, when we were doing the forest bound program this summer in Santa Fe. So the Rosaceae family is a very common family within um, the Santa Fe National Forest. There's a lot of different plants that reside within that family. And so this was an opportunity for us to look at the uh, leaf characteristics of the rose family. And, um, you know, of course, this is a native rose. And then we went and looked and other leaf characteristics of other plants within the surrounding area to see how they relate it to that specific family. Cool. So uh, the um, lesson plan 22, which is uh, measuring and monitoring plant populations, um, you, know, you can see once again it goes through uh, the curriculum goes through you know the time estimate, best seasons. Teacher hints and an overview, which are really, really helpful. Um, so the measuring and monitoring uh, um, lesson plan goes through eight pages, a couple of different charts, um, and uh, uh, several learning objectives uh, to the point where, uh, as well as class discussion at the end. But what uh, it finally finishes up with is, uh, as I talked about before, Estimating plant cover and uh, then going through uh, percentages uh, and then going through uh, density and dominance of different species uh, as well as some soil characteristics and gives you an idea of uh, 
uh, the different species that you're looking at and why they have a specific density and why which plant is the most dominant and why which really uh, all these are dealing with native plants so uh, it's a lot of fun because by the time you're done you've actually helped to characterize through your measuring and monitoring the plant populations the habitat type and that's uh, a lot of fun uh, students get really engaged in it it's very hands-on it's uh, pretty outside and uh, uh, it, it gives a, a, a great uh, finale of, uh, of information and data so this is a picture of um, us doing uh, just that type of uh, quadrat plot measuring in um, a little aspen forest which was uh, right next to a small creek up in the Santa Fe mountains so uh, as you can tell you know we have different types of, of uh, plant types uh, with uh, what's out in the shade and then a clearly uh, marked area which is uh, where shade begins and plant types uh, change drastically so in doing this, uh, we're doing a comparison contrast of doing a quadrat plot, plot over in the area where there's a lot more reeds and grass in the area where there is much more sun and a drier habitat um, and the type of density and dominance that we find there. So the other thing is to notice that these students all have um, journals and they're all uh, being able to writing down what they're finding, putting graphs in their journals. Uh, it's a true field journal at that point. So um, the uh, one of the lesson plans that I talked about, the place I call home, which I think I referred to uh, after the ecoregions uh, in, in that section of ecoregions, uh, this is a really wonderful lesson plan uh, designed to understand uh, the student's location, where we are, what are the physical characteristics around uh, where we are, and what's the climate like, what are the biological characteristics, uh, what type of biodiversity do we see, you know, plants and animals, uh, what type of local plants and rare plants are found as well. So it's designed really to uh, be the basis or the foundation of kind of place-based uh, curriculum and place-based projects uh, that really dovetail into that eco-region of, of where we are in uh, the unique state of New Mexico. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to work with in your, uh, in your field journal as well. And it's also a really wonderful interdisciplinary um, type of, of lesson plan that deals with mapping and deals with history and deals with, uh, you know, as we're going to talk about later on, phonology, uh, climate. Uh, it's really a, a great interdisciplinary uh, lesson plan. And then taking it one step further, as we talked about trying to engage multiple senses when using this curriculum, this is a great lesson plan that delves into um, the creative side of the student. So this is an ecosystem through an artist's eye. And um, the basic premise is to kind of engage with your local environment in a different way, kind of sitting with the plants, sitting with your surroundings, really taking it in and looking at what is on the forest floor, what is above you in the forest canopy, and um, drawing that out in different perspectives. So you can do a um, kind of a micro view, so a very magnified close-up view versus a, um, a larger view and a landscape view. So it gives the students an opportunity to see these different ecosystems and micro ecosystems that are existing with these within these kind of frames that they're looking at their ecosystem in and then gives them the opportunity to draw this out and um, you know provide this perspective on a piece of paper so they can really get a feel of what it's like to do potentially botanical drawing which is a really 
um, important thing when you are a botanist. You know, you can really get a great career as a but it, um, artist doing botanical drawings. So these skills are also transferring over to something that can be used uh, within the real world. We had a student this summer. It's okay. The student this summer that was an incredible artist, and in her field journal, she used this. Um, you know, we were doing this curriculum, and she presented this really beautiful. Um, drawings that were very uh, specific as to the plant, the leaf, the flower. And uh, she really had the, there, yeah, there she is, had this really uh, great opportunity to develop those skills, uh, learn more about the plants that she was drawing, and uh, really understand that she has some of these uh, great skills that can move into uh, into a you know a native plant uh, based kind of uh, career of uh, botanical drawings. It's really wonderful. So we've gone over some examples of individual lessons that you can use. Um, so we want to delve a little bit into how you can extend this further and create student project opportunities out of the curriculum. So you've gone throughout the year, gone throughout your program, and um, utilized many of the individual lesson plans to help build a framework for students to have a, a real um, strong understanding about native plants and the ecology that surrounds them. So there's a number of things that you can do to extend that to student uh, projects as well as easy take home opportunities for students to use as homework as well. Of course, we have the field study journal, which we're going to bring up time and time again as a really important aspect. So they can use the student uh, field study journal to do a lot of this homework. They can also use it to plan out some of these projects. And all of these projects, of course, are in project-based learning, which is a very important aspect to the curriculum as well. So I briefly mentioned uh, the Botanical Terms Challenge earlier as it related to the uh, plant families lesson plan. But the Botanical Terms Challenge is a great lesson to kind of start out with to help students gain that vocabulary that they're going to need to be able to communicate about plants and native plants. So as you can see on the left hand side, there's an extensive list of vocabulary that's associated with this lesson. And basically it is giving these students the vocabulary that they need to be able to communicate. So it's broken out into two different parts. And so this is great because the first part, if you'd like to, you can do within the classroom and the second part students can actually take home with them as homework. The Botanical Terms Challenge contains a reference sheet talking about leaf types, leaf shapes, leaf attachments and arrangements, um, <clears throat> different vocabulary words that are associated with different parts of the plant. So they can use this sheet to help them when they're doing the first part of this lesson plan. And so what they're going to do is they're going to use this sheet. They're going to fill in the vocabulary word on the left hand side. They're going to write in a knowledge connection the actual definition, and then there's also another page where they can use, again, that creativity and draw out um, their association with that plant word. So they put in the word, their knowledge connection is either going to be some sort of word that connects to the functionality of that word, or simply a word that helps um, them to recall what the definition of the word is, or to kind of help them remember what the word is in general. And then, of course, that picture is going to link um, just with another part of the senses, link that back into another part of their brain. So they go through all of the vocabulary words that are provided, writing in the word, knowledge, connection, definition, and drawing the picture. And then you can have a discussion about it. And, you know, what did people see? Sometimes when we're looking at a picture, what we see maybe isn't necessarily what is trying to be conveyed. So this is also a great opportunity to bring in plant specimens and look at them as well. So you can actually see what some examples are of a simple leaf type or a compound leaf type. Students then can take that information and apply it into a 
um, homework projects. So it breaks it out into another lesson, um, the Botanical Terms Challenge Crossword Puzzle. So this is a great one that students can take home, fill out, bring it back, and then you can have a group discussion about what students had filled out within each one of those cells. So again, this lesson is very versatile and can be used outside or in the classroom. This is a, um, a really wonderful little um, example of a riparian restoration plan that uh, comes really more from the, the end of the book. We're doing um, samples of how to create a restoration plan, what place would need a restoration plan, and, um, and how to do it. So it's, uh, this is a planting plan for native trees and shrub species that uh, are along a river corridor riparian habitat. And uh, the strategic placement of uh, the wooden structures to control flow, as well as to uh, um, protect uh, erosion from stream banks, as well as to, you know, it, it, as you go further along, to uh, provide habitat for uh, larger animals. Uh, and it becomes a really wonderful plan um, that uh, you can do. Um, and a student can do actually on their own with an independent study project uh, as it gets toward the end of the of the book of the curriculum. And so this is pretty advanced. I mean, the people are doing this for careers. So this is definitely an example of where the skills that you'd be acquiring from this lesson plan most certainly transfer over to something that you would be doing potentially within an internship once you're in college, if you're interested in the conservation world, um, you know, if you're interested in landscaping in general, there's a lot of skills that can be applicable to, um, you know, the, the next steps for your education. Some people aren't going to necessarily um, be as interested in providing a restoration plan, so there are alternatives to other projects, specifically um, the garden project that we have as well. So when I have done a lot of work with students and even work within the community um, for the Native Plant Society, I ask them, you know, what do you want to learn about and what would really engage you the most with native plants? And time and time again, I hear the answer of, well, I want to know what I can put in my garden, or I want to know what is going to be a great plan for pollinators or potentially as a, um, something that's going to help the soil or even something that's just going to be beautiful. And uh, native plant landscaping is a great thing to get into. We're encouraging folks to implement more um, native plant plantings within their own backyard, and it's a great career to get into to be able to do that. Um, so we have an opportunity for students to be able to create their own native garden project. This can be done within, um, you know, a community plot. So this is, again, creating community partnerships. It can also be done on your school grounds if you have an opportunity to kind of um, break out and create a little area as a native plant demonstration garden for the rest of the school to see. So it's a way for students to really take the knowledge that they've learned and uh, help educate other people about the native plants that they've learned about. Plus in that native plant garden, uh, you're, you can possibly even restore an area that has been degraded on the school grounds and then uh, utilizing uh, our curriculum as well as uh, curriculum that you have or lesson plans that you have to be able to uh, use in that native garden and the and the natural area that you have perhaps created. Right, and there's that list of plants that you can use as well. So there's, in addition to the lesson plan, there's a lot of other useful information and references that you'll be able to use as well as resources. So this is a three-part lesson plan, and it's pretty ex extensive. Um, so it is nice to have, you know, if you are doing this programming throughout the year, to really provide the students with the, an amount of time that is going to allow them to do a lot of research and planning so they can create as good of a project as they can with it. So part one is, of course, research and planning, looking for, you know, what types of soil you have in your local area, what types of plants might do well there, uh, you know, picking a 
plan of how you want to implement your garden. Is it going to be specifically for native pollinators? Is it going to be potentially for, uh, you know, medicine crops? Someone could plant an herbal garden, all of natives. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for how students can use this lesson um, and really take it and run with it. So you've got your research and planning phase. So there's a lot of information in there about what you can do, a lot of prompts for questioning, a lot of prompts for site planning. And then you have part two, so starting the propagation and growing the plants. It gives you a lot of information on what it means to propagate plants, talking about seeds versus starts, talking about germination, dormancy, gives you a lot of that vocabulary there that you're going to go over. A lot of native um, seeds need certain um, conditions for them to be able to grow. So you have the cold moist stratification, you have scarification, which is essentially scratching the seed barrier so the um, seedling, can, seedling can break through. So this gives you information on um, different native plants and how they grow to make it a successful garden. And it talks about how to plant the seeds, how to harden them off. And then part three, planting and celebration. So this is when you actually get to implement that garden project, plant your garden, have a celebration of the garden, you know, make a party out of it. It can be a really, really fun project for students to be working on. And then also it can be a really fun thing for the community to come in and see what they're doing as well. So you can see there's a lot of activities associated with it things to do on planting day, ideas for a celebration, and then suggestions for long-term commemoration of the project. Cool. So when you're implementing the project, it can be done on an individual level or it can be done in groups as well. So if there are students that want to work together, because it is a pretty big project, they can do this. So, um... So far, we've been talking about how this curriculum is written for high school students um, or uh, even uh, some middle school students and upper level high school students um, along that range. Well, it can also be adapted to younger grades, uh, to uh, the young child, uh, to grade school uh, age children. Um, one of the big keys about this uh, curriculum is that it is very hands-on. Uh, it's very project-based. Uh, and those are two things that are really important within younger grades and getting younger grade students uh, involved and kind of hooked into uh, what you're doing with your lesson plans. Uh, utilizing the school grounds, as Sarah was just talking about, is a huge plus. Uh, for adapting this to younger grades, having, uh, you know, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, even sixth grade be able to adopt its own part of that, uh, of, of that garden or uh, to actually create the garden or even a collaboration between two uh, grades, like four and five, uh, to make a garden itself. And then field journaling is a really wonderful uh, way to adapt uh, uh, younger children of utilizing that interdisciplinary approach of uh, science and history and hands-on art, uh, poetry, um, and it becomes a, a really rich type of curriculum just by some simple uh, adaptations of uh, looking at assessments and making those appropriate, uh, as well as what uh, you're doing with each lesson plan. So an example lesson that we kind of put in there of how you can adapt it to younger grades is the lesson of what is a plant. And so this can be as, an ex as extensive or as simple as you want it to be. There's a lot of information on the different, um, you know, plants and then plant allies um, that are in, you know, the New Mexico region and just overall nationally. So you can take the information and do what you want with it. You can scale it down to make it applicable to middle school level. You can even scale it up a little bit more if you want to for, um, you know, those honors, honor grades that 
or, or honor classes that students participate in. So while not all of the lessons can be adapted, there are a fair amount of them that have enough information to where you can extrapolate what you want from it and be able to apply it to the age group that you're working with. And this is something that when I was working with um, uh, grade school level children from kindergarten to fifth grade, I did take what is a plant and actually adapted it to um, kindergarten through second grade and incorporated a couple other resources, sang some songs with them, and they loved it um, and really responded to native plants um, through the work that we did in those lessons. So this is our second break for questions. We're gonna go ahead and open it up, unmute everybody and um, if there's any questions, feel free to ask them now. Any questions? <laughs> We'd be happy to answer anything. We will have an opportunity at the end as yeah. well. Uh, Gina, we do see your message here. No questions at this time. Okay, okay great. Good. We're just going to keep moving forward with it then. And uh, like I said, at the end of the presentation, we will have one final opportunity for folks to ask any last minute questions that they have. So go ahead and mute in everyone again now. Okay, so moving on. So we've talked a lot about the native plant curriculum specifically, um, how you can implement it yourself, some examples of how you can implement it, you know, but not all teachers have the same accessibility for implementing this curriculum, right? So we want to provide as many tools for you as we can. So how the Institute for Applied Ecology can partner with you are a, um, there's a number of different ways that we can help you out. So we're going to go over a few different examples. Currently, we can provide curriculum kits for teachers, which we will talk upon. We have a Facebook support group program, Forest Bound, which is our summer program. And then we're kind of looking to the future of how we can expand a little bit more and help both students and teachers uh, a little bit further. So we have in-person teacher and student workshops that we would like to eventually do. We'd like to continue our educator and agency webinars, and we'd like to expand our Forest Bound program to the greater New Mexico. Great, so uh, the curriculum kits are, um, are really wonderful. They're this really nice box that, that uh, is really difficult to, uh, difficult to break. <laughs> um, and it has a number of uh, uh, pieces of equipment that may be difficult for you to get or really have are more uh, specific to um, what the Institute for Applied Ecology has produced. I'm going to try to get my little mouse there. So this is uh, not a rose. Uh, those are actually flags uh, to be able to flag out a specific plot or a specific area that you want to do a study in if you're in the forest or even on your school grounds. Um, on the other side is a plant press for you to be able to create and use uh, native plants and make uh, uh, your own herbarium, your own school or your own uh, grades herbarium. Uh, then we have identification book of, uh, of New Mexico, uh, wildflowers of central uh, and northern New Mexico, uh, a uh, hand lens, um, which is called a micro viewer um, to be able to look at plant parts, even uh, soil insects, uh, a um, compass that's over here, uh, of course, an indestructible ruler, um, uh, hand trowel and pruners to be able to utilize in the field. Our own curriculum will be in each box. Uh, this is uh, the red box, so it has a red tape across it and everything is taped, so uh, has a, a red mark to it. Uh, an ecoregions map uh, that will be in uh, each box. Um, as well as um, 
a whiteboard, which is not shown here, uh, for you to be able to, uh, you know, basically have a, a, a chalkboard outside. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, what I'm forgetting is the uh, big quadrat plot square that actually folds down, so it's like about the size of, a, of, a, of an umbrella, a regular sized umbrella. And those are available for checkout for you to be able to help you with um, for the, with this curriculum. We'll, we'll add more um, pieces of equipment as uh, you guys think they're needed, as well as uh, when we uh, find out if there's more specific things that are needed for each particular uh, piece of uh, the curriculum, each particular lesson plan. Um, so we have things that are not shown in here are uh, some flagging tape as well as uh, a large measuring tape. Uh, thermometer is uh, further down. Um, and um, so as I said, we'll add more to this teacher box uh, to support um, uh, the equipment needs for you for each lesson. Um, so currently we only have two kits and um, they are both located in Santa Fe. We are working to try and get a kit down in the southern region of New Mexico for, fo uh, New Mexico for folks to rent. At this time, we don't have kits available for purchase. Um, they are essentially free to rent. There might be, if we do need to ship it, there could be potentially a shipping cost. If you are interested in purchasing a kit, however, we can work with you um, to build your own kit if you do have the means to do so. So that if that is something you're interested in, definitely contact us. We're happy to you know, get you the list of what's in our kits, um, help you find the resources to build your kit, and yeah, put it together uh, for you to have yourself. That's a great Thank idea. You. So this is uh, the plant press uh, that we have. Um, uh, we're going to go through three pieces of equipment that we have uh, that are designed for you to use in the field as well as the classroom because uh, you can bring back your uh, specimens and then uh, lay them out in here and then tag them and then of course press them and then you, you can actually develop your your own uh, classes or your own schools uh, on herbarium, which is a very, very cool thing to do. Um, this is the uh, ecoregions of New Mexico. Each uh, kit will have this map in it um, and uh, describes the ecoregions, where we are, of course, and the different types of ecoregions and why they are ecoregions of New Mexico. And that supports a big chunk of our curriculum, uh, um, two, two uh, big lesson plans of nine pages and seven pages. So it's really important. Um, and then, of course, the quadrat plot square, which uh, folds up nicely uh, in its little elastic uh, bands and uh, is pretty indestructible. But it's a great piece of equipment, sometimes really difficult to find. Uh, so we include it in the kit. Um, it supports um, uh, the measurement, uh, monitoring and measuring uh, curriculum or a lesson plan, as well as several other lesson plans it can be used for. Um, so it's a, it's a nice, nice piece to, to add to the equipment box. So the other opportunity for support is um, we've created a Facebook support group. And so this is a great way to, um, you know, you're, of course, welcome to email us or call us at any time. But the Facebook support group is, um, you know, a good place to not only get in contact with us, but to be able to chat with each other um, and get different feedback from each other on what you're doing to implement this curriculum within your group. So, you know, if you're working with a specific lesson plan and you find that you've done something that maybe isn't in the lesson plan, that you've been able to expand it, expand, expand the lesson plan, you know, we want to hear about it. And I'm sure other educators within New Mexico would want to hear about it too. So this is an opportunity for you all to communicate together, talk about, you know, what's been working well, what hasn't been working well, and what you yourselves are doing to implement this curriculum. It's nice to be able to bounce ideas off of each other. And so we want to create a platform for you to be able to do that. 
You also don't necessarily have to be a Facebook user to see the group. I believe you might have to be one to engage and write within the wall. However, you can just simply observe what people are writing if you don't specifically have Facebook. Again, calling and emailing with any questions is also an option as well. And finally, we want to talk a little bit about our summer program. So, you know, we've talked about these lessons um, and what you can do, and, and uh, we've tried them out ourselves. So, Forestbound um, was piloted for the first time last summer in the Santa Fe National Forest. We were able to try out 14 of our uh, lesson plans that are actually in the curriculum and apply them to, uh, you know, an educational setting within the Santa Fe National Forest. It was a great program. We really enjoyed it. We learned a lot and, and the students had a really fun time being able to get out of their kind of normal surroundings and get out into nature and really experience it for what it has to offer. A couple lessons that we did, um, one of which isn't actually included um, within the book itself, but more of a supplemental program is the uh, seed collection workshop that we did and so this was a great one because we were able to partner with uh, the institute again and um, get a couple other people out to the forest so melanie geisler our southwest program director and victoria atencio the southwest program seed collection crew lead came out and did a workshop with us and so it was on seed collection uh, and plant collection as well. So we walked the uh, surrounding area of our site. We looked at where we could potentially collect seed from, how to tell when seed was ready, uh, kind of the ethics of seed collection to, um, you know, how much seed you should actually collect from a given area, as well as how to plot different areas to be able to come back to it if the seed isn't ready. We also collected a number of plant specimens to bring back to the um, main site where we were at uh, and uh, press those plant specimens. And there is a lesson that goes over plant pressing as well uh, and collecting plant specimens. But that seed collection workshop was a great addition because we uh, were able to really provide a hands-on opportunity for students to see how to collect seed to collect it themselves, and then to actually come over and, and clean it themselves. So that second picture is uh, the students taking the seed and actually cleaning it and seeing what that process entails. So it was a really well-rounded um, sort of supplemental program that we put into the Forest Bound program that we were able to expand even into the community as well. Since then, we've held a number of workshops with uh, YouthWorks, which is another local organization working with youth in Santa Fe. We had a work day with them um, and provided an opportunity to learn about native seed there. And we also uh, brought the workshop out to the community in general um, and hope to have it as a model that can be um, extended out to other communities. Um, another great lesson we had, you know, again, was uh, incorporating the artistic creativity. So we had drawing, uh, a weed drawing opportunity. We had um, folks who could draw, uh, draw out ecosystems. We have a lot of different um, opportunities for lesson plans that incorporate really uh, um, students' creativity. And we will get to questions um, in just a moment. Uh, we want to just get through a couple more things. Um, so then the last one we did was the last day, and that one was really, really fun. Um, it was kind of a culmination of everything we learned and a celebration of every learn, everything we learned. And so celebrations, I think, is a really important part of it. So what we did is we uh, harvested some Douglas fir tips and made a tea out of them. We made mesquite pancakes. Uh, with some choke cherry jelly, and then we all learned how to make a traditional salve. So it was a trementina salve, which is made from pine sap. And so the students loved it and were extremely engaged the entire time. They were asking a lot of questions and made it very clear that, you know, the way we really get folks to engage is to create a relationship with a plant. And it's as simple as that, you know. And one way of doing that is, you know, plants as food, plants as medicine. And so this was a really fun way to engage the students, 
and get them to, you know, interact with the plants in, in another way besides drawing, besides learning about it. They were actually able to taste the plants and work with them. At the end of the day, we also had a Jeopardy game. And so that was really fun as well. Students throughout the week were actually creating their own Jeopardy questions. So they weren't provided by us. The students were coming up the, with the questions themselves. And then we simply supplied the platform for them to play the game. And they got super into it. They were having a ball. They were yelling. It was a really fun experience. And you could tell that they knew you know, they, they knew all the answers and they had all of the information they needed and, were, and really created some critical thinking questions um, for the Jeopardy game. So it was a fun last day. And one thing that we learned from it is that we really do want to incorporate more of the ethnobotanical side of um, the native plant curriculum into uh, the program kind of during all of the days. This was also a great opportunity for us to partner with another organization. We brought in um, a woman from Earth Care who is uh, indigenous, and she came and talked a lot about decolonizing the diet and native plants as foods and kind of traditional food systems and brought uh, a really authentic um, uh, viewpoint on it. And we were able to kind of critically analyze the way that we currently interact with our own food system versus traditional ways of um, interacting with our food system using native plants uh, versus using, you know, exotics that we brought in from other areas. And so it was a really good look at um, it outside of kind of the ecology of plants, of, but how are we using them socially, culturally, and as food, as medicine. Um, and it was a great addition to the program. So, you know, you can, we've, we're using these lessons, but we're using it as an opportunity to partner with all these other people who have a lot of great information to share about native plants and ecology overall. Um, students love to listen to people that are in, in, involved in careers that have to do with plants and habitat and ecology. So uh, the people that we had speak were really wonderful, really accessible, and uh, captivating for the students to uh, to know what's uh, what is a you know what does a forest service person do? What do people do in fish and wildlife? You know what's a you know a forest scientist do? What's a wetland scientist do? And uh, as well as dealing with their own food, as well as dealing with uh, uh, Native American uses of, uh, of native plants, uh, and then what Sarah was talking about, how we use plants as, as medicines and the ethnobotany uh, connection uh, with plants. So it's a, it's a five-day or four or five-day program and uh, is the type of program that you could probably do if you had, you know, six to eight hours with students, or you could split it up into a type of uh, a 10 day program but uh, as Sarah offered before you are welcome to come as um, volunteers uh, people that uh, you know if you just want to come and, and just experience the curriculum and the way we teach it for a day uh, and then uh, see how it works uh, that would be really a, a great time to do it during this forest bound program. Once we talk about the Native Plant Society, um, I'm actually going to show you the link of where that information for the summer program is. So, uh, student workshops, uh, the curriculum really uh, supports independent study. It supports um, students that want to work ahead or want to work on their own. Um, and so uh, what we'd like to do is to uh, provide in-class student workshops and some after-class programming uh, that shows students how to use this curriculum. Um, we're hoping to do that, also generating some real excite excitement about this type of curriculum, which is really place-based and gets students involved with native plants. And as Sarah's been saying, this, this intimate relationship with plants and habitat ecoregions. Um, right, and so this is an opportunity for 
us to come into your classroom. And again, this is looking to the future. So this is something that we hope to eventually implement, but this is an opportunity for us to be able to come into your classroom and do these workshops with students, as well as other supporting organizations. There's been a lot of interest in um, helping with the program. And, and if we aren't potentially able to come to your classroom, there might be someone from an, another organization that has knowledge and experience with native plants that could come in and do this work. So teacher support, we're hoping to uh, provide uh, well, our current support with uh, what Sarah's been talking about um, with uh, Facebook uh, mentoring. Uh, we have supplemental webinars like we're doing right now. Uh, the supplemental materials, the equipment box that can be checked out and utilized by you with this curriculum. In the future, we hope to create a, a much more of a, a connection with a mentorship with teachers, um, helping you through this curriculum, uh, and uh, being there to, uh, to provide uh, any background or information that you might need, uh, answer questions, or even speak to your class if you wanted, uh, but to help you out. Uh, and then also in the future, we hope uh, to provide uh, teacher workshops where we go through some of this curriculum, utilize the equip equipment box, uh, and actually teach a couple of lesson plans with you guys um, to support you uh, and encourage you to involve this curriculum in your, in your school. So we also want to provide you with some additional resources so that you have as full of a toolbox to be able to use this curriculum um, and implement this type of programming into your uh, classrooms or whatever programs you have currently. Um, so in addition to the book, there's some other resources that we find um, would be valuable for you to be able to use. One of those is going to be the Plant ID apps and online resources. So, you know, if you're out in the field and you are on a plant walk with your students and you don't know the plant, there are lists of the plants in the um, Ponderosa de Prickly Pear curriculum. However, you might be on the go, you might not have the curriculum, you might want to know something right away. So these are some sites and some apps that you can download on your phone that provide you with that information on being able to identify some specific plants within the area. Um, there's the great uh, New Mexico wildflowers app, the Call the Flower wildflowers high country apps. Um, that's a really great one. Uh, a lot of the flowers transfer over from Colorado to New Mexico. Um, and then Signet is a great, great online resource for plant identification. So these are some tools that you can have in your back pocket for when you're out in the field and need a little bit of help um, with plant identification and don't necessarily want to key it out or don't have a key um, to be able to figure it out. There's other uh, organizations that are also great resources for you. Um, there's the Environmental Education Association of New Mexico. Uh, they just provided a great conference that we recently went to. They're doing a lot of hard work to help uh, environmental educators of New Mexico do the work that, that we're trying to do, um, help it be accessible, help us try to find grants for the work that we're doing. They'll have a lot of great information, um, and many of you may already be familiar with them, but if you're not, I would encourage you to get on their website and kind of just check them out, see what they're doing, um, and really explore the great work that they're doing to help um, build the community of environmental educators. Many of you are probably familiar with the North American Association for Environmental Education. That's a great resource. The Hands on Land is a great resource also for grant opportunities and other webinars. The Native Plant Society is also an excellent resource for uh, more information on native plants. Project-Based Learning and Experiential Education Association are two other organizations that have a lot of um, supplemental information on experiential learning. And so I want to quickly just take you, um, well, I want to talk about the Native Plant Society uh, for a minute and just give you some more information because there's a lot of people that are excellent resources to tap into from the Native Plant Society to help you with this curriculum. So we have seven chapters, uh, six of which are located within New Mexico. One is in El Paso. You can see those seven chapters here on the board. It's El Paso, Santa Fe, Las Cruces, Taos, Albuquerque. Otero and Gila. And so 
all of these chapters hold monthly meetings for um, their members and also for the community at large. There's a lot of great, great talks, a lot of great information on native plants. I recently went to one on native plants for pollinators and learned a whole bunch of information on the New Mexico native um, flora for pollinators in the state. And they're engaging and they're fun. And there's a lot of really knowledgeable people from teachers to retired botanists, um, to volunteers, to native landscape people. Uh, you know, there's a wealth of knowledge there um, that can be tapped into. And so on our website, we actually have an events calendar um, that organizes all of the different events that are going on associated with each of the different chapters of the Native Plant Society, as well as other um, events that are going on simply about the local environment or about the native plants or about um, native plants in general. And so I want to just kind of briefly go over the website with you so you have um, kind of this information at your fingertips. Of course, the events calendar is going to be under the events page, and you can take a look at that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of information on there for you. And then I want to talk about um, the resources really quick. So. If you take a look at this, there's a lot on plant ID and collection, growing natives, plants for central New Mexico gardens, there's books, newsletters, a lot of different literature, and there's also a discussion group. So there's the, um, there's a Google group that is um, circulates, and you can post questions about native plants on there, and you'll get an answer within one to two hours. People are great about responding to any questions that people have. Um, so there's a lot of great resources on here for you to take advantage of. There's also the community engagement. And so that's where information on um, this webinar is, as well as information on the Forest Bound program. And like I said, it's a little sparse right now. We are boosting it um, currently, and registration will be in 2018. But there is the... Um, links to download the curriculum or purchase the curriculum here. There um, is going to be more information on teacher resources as we're able to expand those. And there's also information on student opportunities as we expand those as well. And so we talk a little bit about Forest Bound and um, the fact that registration will open in January. And if you'd like to be on our email list for more on information on those student opportunities, you can fill out the form below and um, get on our mailing list and we can send you more information once we have that available. Some supplemental books that go along with um, this type of learning as well as this particular curriculum or Flora Neomexicana, which is kind of the Bible for this particular area. Um, and it's illustrated, which is makes it even better. Uh, it's a wonderful, really beautiful book. Um, some uh, educational uh, literature and books that support exactly what it is that we're all interested in and what this curriculum is doing um, is uh, Last Child in the Woods, wonderful book, um, uh, going through the background and the history of uh, uh, nature deficit disorder um, and the idea of getting kids outside, getting children outside to learn and how important that is for our future uh, and for our ecosystem's future. Uh, Learning by Doing uh, is um, a, a short book, small book that uh, gets into uh, various uh, new currents in uh, experiential education and how experiential education is involved in so much more learning now, uh, outdoor education, environmental education, uh, uh, place-based education, and uh, of course, uh, 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 service-based education as well. Uh, another small book, uh, Setting a Standard for Project-Based Learning, which is a really wonderful uh, foundation and proof of how project-based learning works and um, uh, how it uh, really captures students and is a wonderful way to, to learn and a wonderful way to 
uh, to use this particular curriculum. There's another uh, book that has to do with um, place-based learning, and that's uh, supported by the Orion Society uh, from the Orion magazine uh, that you may be familiar with. And place-based learning is incredibly important as well and is also utilized by uh, the Forest Service and especially the Fish and Wildlife Service um, with their programs uh, and the Forest Service with their programs, uh, as well as Bureau of Land Management with their programs, too. So uh, these are really wonderful books that um, support and supplement uh, this particular curriculum. Uh, upcoming events, the Education Advisory Council that is uh, hosted by the Friends of Valle de Oro uh, in Albuquerque um, is uh, presenting uh, on November the 28th. It's uh, uh, 4.30 to 6.30 in the afternoon uh, at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History. The Education Advisory Council is really the uh, education, Environmental Education Association of New Mexico. Uh, they are uh, wanting to find out more about what people are doing with environmental education and uh, establishing an advisory council that will support that organization. It's really worth going to, and if you can make it, it would really be worthwhile. North American Association for Environmental Education has a uh, workshop on December the 8th from 1 to 4 at Valle de Oro uh, National Wildlife Refuge. Another exceptional event that uh, would be great to attend. And then the Society for Ecological Restoration Conference is uh, in the Southwest, uh, for the Southwest, is coming up from December the 6th to the 8th in Albuquerque at the uh, uh, Hotel Albuquerque. And there's a website for it. There is an exceptional conference and incorporates really wonderful uh, scientists and educators uh, from around the Southwest region. Another wonderful conference, and it's and it's here. Usually, the ecological restoration conferences is a big society, you know, take place in in other areas, and so it's wonderful. It's going to be in the southwest here. Citizen science uh, is a, a new science. It's uh, the science of uh, phenology. It's the science of uh, of recognizing change, and it's the science of of uh, what's happening in our world and citizen science is exactly what it means it's uh citizens it's us it's everyone uh you know it's the garden club it's the parent it's the the uh, um, neighborhood association it's the school it's the classroom it's individuals that all are involved with uh, participation and recognizing how what's happening with our world and how it looks and how it changes uh, the science of phenology, how how the seasons change uh, the growth of native plants, which attract pollinators, which attract other animals. Um, there is a, a citizen science grant, and there's a, um, a, a connection to it where you can find out those funding opportunities. And when that grant uh, closes, which I think is the end of January, Project Bud Burst is a really wonderful online connection for any classroom to get involved with, any individual to get involved with. And around the state, it's connected with uh, Valle de Oro and National Wildlife Refuge, as well as the Bureau of Land Management, as well as uh, the Santa Fe Botanical Garden, uh, a few other organizations as well. Uh, Monarch Watch is a uh, nationwide um, program watching uh, monarchs as they migrate and tabulating where they go, where they're found, and their numbers, uh, which Monarch Watch has been uh, responsible for showing uh, monarch uh, species uh, starting to dwindle uh, and uh, has created a tremendous response, even from our own organization of Institute for Applied Ecology being involved with research and, and replanting uh, uh, opportunities and exercises and, and science around the state. Um, and then NestWatch is uh, through Cornell University. It's a wonderful little website that tabulates and looks at 
uh, nests, uh, nesting birds, uh, and uh, as they move across the country and within their range and uh, their migratory uh, patterns. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful website it's set up really well. Uh, so that you can look at a different species, for instance, uh, the western bluebird, uh, and see where that species is occurring and where the range is and how you can help uh, that species, which happens to be uh, uh, having some hard hits and it's uh, losing in its populations, uh, mostly due to uh, nesting cavities. Um, so that's a wonderful one that uh, classes and individuals and schools uh, can get involved with uh, and uh, be a part of this science that incorporates in this wonderful little Venn diagram of uh, public participation in science and online communities, uh, which are anyone, and then the scientific uh, uh, community uh, and the collaboration with that. Uh, brings, uh, you know, crowdsourcing and volunteer monitoring and infrastructure, cyber uh, infrastructure, and becomes this really, really dynamic uh, science that everyone can be involved with. So uh, the Citizen Science Association uh, website is up there, citizenscience.org, and uh, there are many different opportunities to get involved, and it's a great organization to be involved with. So to wrap it up, we want to uh, make sure to thank our funders and partners who have made this project and other projects that we're working on possible. So the Forest Service and the BLM uh, were instrumental in providing funding and support for us to be able to do this webinar, for us to be able to do the Forest Band project, and uh, to continue the work that we're trying to do um, to get the word out about the native plant curriculum. Uh, native plants in general, and about the summer program that we're putting on. The Native Plant Society of New Mexico has also played a large part in providing um, hours for us to be able to do this work as well. So these guys were, um, we wouldn't have been able to do what we're trying to do without any of these partners. So we want to make sure to thank them and to uh, acknowledge their work within uh, what we're doing as well. So to wrap it all up, you know, the best cure for plant blindness is to make a connection, establish a relationship, and then build upon that relationship and provide um, exciting opportunities and experiences for us to do that work. Uh, you know, I, I want to reiterate that we will be sending this PDF out to you, so you will have a copy of all this information. We will be putting this recording up online, and we will give all of that information to you uh, after the webinar. And we want to just open it up one more time for questions, if there's any last questions that folks have. I had one more question. This is Robin. Um, do you have the recipes for the food that you guys made on the forest bound trip? Um, we don't have them written down. I would be happy to write it out for you. Um, you know, again, just contact us with that information and, um, you know, we'd be more than happy to supply that. There is a recipe for a cottonwood staff specifically within the curriculum. So there are some uh, options in there for you, uh, some resources to make okay. baskets. Um, there's also uh, something called a burden basket. So there's uh, some uh, instructions on how to make that basket. But if you want more, I am happy to provide you with what we did specifically, as well as other native plant recipes. Okay, great. And the best way to get a hold of you is just to reply to the email that you sent us with the link. Is that right? Um, yeah, you can do that. And both of our emails are on this uh, PowerPoint as well. So you'll have that information, but you are welcome to reply to that. Oh, okay. And and you're um, going to be sending to, I guess, I originally heard about you guys because someone at my school happened to just send me something but now i'm in your i'll get all your information now is that right um yeah we will definitely be sending out um you know this information to you guys we have all of your emails and information saved at this point so um, okay. 
And we did have a question in there. If you would like to receive more information, we have that noted. And so if you did say yes, we will um, be sending you out, you know, the next steps and, and other information that we have as well. Okay. And one more thing. What time of year is the forest bound and where is it going to be this year? So forest bound is uh, typically in the summer. It's uh, when when students are out of school. Um, this year it is definitely going to be in June, and then depending on funding, um, we will be expanding it into July as well. Uh, we do have secured funding for two weeks in the Santa Fe National Forest, and so what we're working on right now is trying to expand that to the Cibola Forest. Okay. This was incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, good. Oh, good. I'm glad. Great. Well, if if no one has any other questions, then we're going to go ahead and close the evening out and let you get on with your evening. Thank you so much for uh, participating in the yeah, webinar. You, and um, feel free to email us or call us at any time if you have any questions or want to talk more about um, the work that we're doing. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.